Welcome to Coronavirus The Rundown. I'm Usher Qureshi. Each day we highlight the ways communities are taking on coronavirus. We also break down the major headlines. Today, new unemployment numbers. 2.1 million people filed new unemployment claims last week. That's down from 2.4 million the week before. Dollar stores say coronavirus helped boost sales as people started looking for cheaper products when the pandemic started. Dollar General and Dollar Tree both saw major first quarter sales bumps. Dollar General says its sales are starting to become more volatile. Researchers hope a new study will help explain why coronavirus is killing black Americans at disproportionate rates. Researchers at LSU conducted detailed autopsies on 10 African-American patients who died from coronavirus. They found blood clots clogging small vessels in the lungs of all 10 and found blood markers the body makes when it's trying to dissolve clots. Study authors are hopeful their targeted study will ultimately help improve African-American mortality rates. We mentioned the unemployment numbers. Alicia Nieves is looking into concerns there could be another more widespread wave of layoffs. Most thought as states started to reopen, millions of people would get back to work and unemployment would decline swiftly. But instead, it's still on the rise. The Department of Labor's latest report shows another 2.1 million people filed for unemployment last week, bringing the 10-week total to more than 40 million jobless claims. And unfortunately, we, we, we haven't yet hit the bottom. Julia Pollack is a labor economist at ZipRecruiter. We could have one to three million more layoffs each week for the next few weeks as one industry after the other gets hit by this crisis. While job losses in the restaurant and tourism industry have been significant in the last two months, industries like the media and advertising have suddenly started cutting jobs as well. We're also seeing uh, an increase in layoffs among government, local and state government workers. A broader wave of unemployment is concerning because already 42 of the country's 50 states now have historically high unemployment unemployment rates, according to a new report by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. States dependent on tourism and manufacturing like Nevada, Michigan, and Hawaii are leading the country with the highest unemployment rates. The difference between a Michigan versus a Nevada and a Hawaii, while all have seen very high unemployment increases, Michigan will probably be able to rebound more quickly because manufacturing as an industry is able to rebound more quickly. Analysts like Jill Gonzalez with Wallet Hub are seeing bright spots with manufacturing and construction, but overall say the data is showing the labor market will have a much slower recovery than first expected. This is going to change how Americans and probably how global citizens work forever, right? We're seeing changes in terms of do we need offices? Is that going to be more of a perk now? If you don't have an office, do you need to live 20 minutes away from the closest city? Uh, can you prioritize other things like school systems or health care? You know, really looking at other bigger picture items for your family rather than just making a big portion of your life around work. I'm Alicia Nieves reporting. Drinking at home has become easier during this pandemic. More states are allowing restaurants to sell cocktails and beers to go. There's alcohol delivery, and some are meeting up with friends for virtual happy hour. In late March, around the time stay-at-home orders began, alcohol sales in the U.S. spiked by about 55%. American addiction centers found that 40% of people polled reported drinking more now that they're at home. American Addiction Center says people who are genetically prone to addiction are most at risk during this time because they're spending more time at home by themselves. Here in the office, for example, in an office space, you're not going to be drinking, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's constraints in, chat, in place there in, in that environment. When you're at home, there's none of those constraints. Some signs that someone could be developing an addiction to alcohol include getting up in the morning and needing to have a drink, having trouble cutting down on their drinking, and not meeting obligations because they're drinking. Addiction experts say one thing to combat this is establishing a routine. You have a daily pattern of habits that you do. Try to emulate what you did before the COVID uh, pandemic. You know, try to try to have a structure, keep yourself busy and productive. Spending time indoors can also make it tempting to drink, so experts say try to spend more time outdoors and get some physical activity in. 
Well, millions of business owners are finding out their disaster insurance doesn't cover the coronavirus shutdown. Now, some are pushing for class action lawsuits. Back in 2008 with the SARS outbreak, they changed the verbiage on all of the policies. Okay. So now all these folks who thought they had coverage when they were shut down by the state for this pandemic might not. And so the attorneys are, of course, going after the insurance companies to get this addressed and get this taken care of. Scott Hardy with TopClassActions.com says while a class action lawsuit would simplify everything, the process takes a while. Hardy says he expects to see class action lawsuits where consumers sue companies over canceled products, events, and services. He also expects employees and their families to sue companies over working conditions. Service members coming home from deployment are missing out on traditional homecoming celebrations right now. Vanessa Paz met a student who's trying to change that. Since CSU San Marcos student Adrian McWilliams was little, the service was always near and dear to her heart. My dad was active duty for about 20 years. And when I was like early elementary school, my mom started working for the Marine Corps. So that's always been like a pretty big part of my life, I would say. So when she found out that those coming home from deployment wouldn't get that staple celebration. It just kind of made me think about how when I was really young and my dad was deployed, whenever he came back, there was always that like big homecoming moment that you get to see like the type of stuff that goes viral on the internet, all the stuff. She took matters into her own hands, creating thank you and welcome home packages for returning service members. I'm doing everything I can to try to make sure that um, there's at least a little handwritten note on it that says welcome home and thank you for your service. So they at least get a little bit of that homecoming feel that they would get if this were under um, usual circumstances. She also includes your basic essentials like toiletries and snacks, something she says they could use since many of them have to self quarantine for two weeks before reuniting with family. The Marines that are coming home do deserve a special homecoming, coming home after a long deployment and then having to quarantine is not an ideal situation. She gathered gift and donations thanks to friends, family, and the community, all from word of mouth. Her first batch was given to 35 returning members last Thursday. I've always kind of liked giving back, but um, when it's something that I'm passionate about and I have a personal connection to, obviously the motivation is a little bit stronger and it is something that like, I guess hits a little closer to home. Her next 50 will be given to those returning home June 2nd. And for anyone who may have missed her care packages when they arrived. We do still see you, like we are still appreciative. She thanks them for their service. Some cities are closing streets to cars during the pandemic so people have more room to walk and bike. We're asking whether the changes could become permanent. And a mother's warning about disinfected shopping carts after her little girl got chemical burns on her arms and legs. Vienna Tour. Some cities are closing roads to cars so people can have more space to walk, bike, or just be outside right now. Bo Evans looks at whether the changes could become permanent. We advocate for every neighborhood in Seattle to be a great place to walk, bike, and live. Reclaiming the streets has a different meaning to Clara Cantor. She's a member of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. One of its main goals is to make Seattle, Washington a more walkable or bikeable city. We needed some additional space for people to be outside, both for physical and mental health, and just to get around for folks who are still going to the essential services. The coronavirus pandemic has given Seattle and other cities across the U.S. a unique opportunity to change busy city streets into something more like a neighborhood playground. We're seeing a, a really beautiful thing happening where um, families are coming out biking together. I've been out and you see people walking dogs and elders out walking, kids playing in the middle of the street with sidewalk chalk. During the pandemic, Seattle repurposed 20 miles of what it calls stay healthy streets. Local traffic can continue to drive through slowly, but all other traffic is not allowed. So you see a lot of people walking, biking in the street, which is perfectly fine. We encourage people to keep it moving. Um, so this isn't a place to just set up your barbecue in the middle of the street. But if you're doing something active, you're using it to exercise or get around, that's fine. 
The idea is to give people a place to walk, run, bike, be outside, but have enough space to spread out. But now, these will be permanent fixtures in Seattle. We realize this is a really good opportunity uh, to make this permanent uh, because these stay healthy streets um, are a really great amenity going forward to achieve a lot of our other goals too. Because as the economy starts to start up again, people are going to need to have good ways to get around without a car. Other cities like New York, Denver, Cincinnati, and more have closed streets to traffic for walking or sometimes to give dense commercial areas a chance to spread out. Sometimes for social distance lines out the door or in some places to give restaurants outdoor seating. The practice is having mixed reviews in Cincinnati where closing off streets has impacted residents' parking. We pay the park. And, and then we still got to find somewhere else to park because they want to party or whatever they want to do out here. I know that there are many parkers in, in around the city with the residential parking program that are concerned. But in Seattle, it remains a positive addition for most. And they're happy it's not just a pandemic perk. It's a really wonderful way for us to be in community with each other, um, even from a distance, in a way that's that's kind of hard to find right now. I'm Bo Evans reporting. Google is launching some new tools to help businesses get through this pandemic. Businesses can now add what are known as support links on their Google page. The links show people how they can support that small business. That can be anything from making a donation to buying a gift card. Businesses can also show what services are available during this time. Appointments can also now be made directly through Google. A child ended up with chemical burns on her legs after a trip to the store. Now her mom wants other parents to be aware. Bobby Eden says the burns showed up on Finley shortly after a trip to Walmart last week. They saw a doctor who told them the marks looked like chemical burns. Eden says she told Walmart she thinks the burns came from its disinfected carts. He advised to me at that point, um, you know, kids have sensitive skin. Uh, they do use an ind industrial type sanitizer that they spray on the carts. This was brought down from corporate due to the COVID-19. Um, there's really not much that can be done, but she was sorry. Finley is okay. Bobby says she hopes stores think about safer ways to disinfect carts. She says she's also now looking into cart covers and blankets. Well, a family is trying to bring joy to people through music. As Jasmine Stiles shows us, they're taking their tunes to unique places around Florida. Everybody has different walks of life, but music is universal. Since high school, Angel and Laron Hurst have been attached at the hip, singing together in their show choir when they were teenagers. Then they got hitched, and now they perform wherever they're invited. Years ago, right when we first started singing together, we would do random, spontaneous, go to different places and just start singing. And when the pandemic canceled all their planned gigs... My wife was just like, hey, why don't you, you should start playing outside? And I was like... It's a good idea. So if I'm playing, then that means you're singing. So now their venues include hospital entrances, driveways, or even a computer screen. And they're bringing their four-year-old son, English, along for the ride. We're doing it in our neighborhood, and they're enjoying it. I think we should start trying to see what other people are open to and if they're open to us coming out. Laurent started posting his neighborhood performances online, asking if anyone else wanted to hear music in the streets. People jumped on the opportunity. We were at a birthday party um, this past weekend and did a song and a lady was like, I'm crying behind my sunglasses. To hear someone say, you know, a song that you sung lifted my spirits and gave me hope is just priceless to me. People are looking for new outlets for their energy right now. We're looking at how the arts are helping people. E6 working together, working for you. Welcome back. The past few months have been far from easy as we all deal with the changes brought on by the pandemic. As Dan Grossman explains, some people are turning to art, looking for a way to heal. By definition, 
Art is the expression of human creative skill. But through practice... Art is oftentimes about creating community and identity. Art can be therapy. For me, it's a really, it kind of just like opens and calms and it helps me think. They are just four artists. When you're focusing on playing in tune and making good sound, uh, nothing else really matters. <laughs> Four of the countless artists nationwide whose work transcends expression. And the act of stitching for me is very meditative. And provides an outlet for healing. What we're doing is we're creating these seed packets. And placing them here along the local river for people to find and plant. There's so many things that you're feeling that you can't really express through words or language. Art creates this kind of, whether it's metaphor, whether it's through indirect some sort of expression, being able to open up. I um, have a feeling of dread. Ellen Winner is a professor of psychology at Boston College and author of the book How Art Works. There's no question that art leads to well-being. She says during turbulent times, art can offer a constant. A way to also kind of honor what, why we're all stuck at home right now. An outlet that allows people to process and relax, even if they don't have an artistic skill. Instead of focusing on the what ifs, I thought I would focus on the people that are directly impacted. It's what inspired Heather Schulte to create her tapestry, outlining the spread of the virus in our country. Each blue stitch represents a confirmed coronavirus case, and each red stitch a loss of life. And on April 11th, my uncle was diagnosed. Last month, two of those stitches became personal. Two days later, he was taken to the hospital and did not uh, survive the coronavirus infection that he had. It's become a way to meditate, hold vigil, um, commemorate the people who have suffered and who have died and their family members and their caregivers and the doctors and nurses who are working overtime to manage the crisis right now. Professor Winner says the art can be music, coloring, rearranging a room, anything that allows us to express what we're feeling through creation. We want to kind of create, like instigate this kind of platform or way for um, storytelling to happen. Creating some relief along the way. It just feels very invigorating and it makes you want to take risks and it makes you want to find a maximum expression in what you're doing. Um, and that's extremely liberating and gratifying. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. Learning about coronavirus without having to read. The community's one group hopes to help with these coloring books. Next. Just search RTV6. Welcome back. We like to end the rundown with the stories that remind us of the good going on. Today, artists in Kansas City are helping people in their community learn more about coronavirus, regardless of what language they speak. They're creating coloring books that raise awareness. I would like to see them adapt a habit of good health while having a good time doing it, coloring their world. The city plans on handing out the coloring books in zip codes where most people speak a language other than English. And a group of veterans is helping fuel workers on the front lines through a coffee shop. Over the past two months, they've donated more than 300 pounds of coffee nationwide. It's gone to first responders, healthcare workers, and facilities, including the USNS Comfort. The trio of veterans says customers can also help by buying donation boxes. Well, that's all the time we have today for Coronavirus, the Rundown. We'll see you next time. I'm Usher Qureshi. Thanks for joining us.